Hello, Jason here again. So, a bit of a different video this time. This video is about uh, the Irish Jewish community, uh, the past, uh, the present, the future. Um, originally, the plan was to just interview one person as normal, uh, but it kind of grew into something a little bit extra, and it's two interviews uh, one with uh, Hilary Abrahamson, who is a volunteer down at the Jewish Irish Museum in Portobello. Um, I'd highly recommend people go visit there. It's very interesting. And then the other is with Dr. Morris Casey of Queen's University, Belfast. Um, he is a bit of an expert on the topic, and he is uh, currently working up in Belfast, but had previously been the um, historian in residence at the Irish Emigration Museum in Dublin. Yeah, so uh, enjoy. Not, um, I'll give you the earliest known mention okay. of Irish, yeah. of, of Jews in Ireland. There's something called the Annals of Inish Fallon, which were written by the monks. They were down around the Kerry area. And the, the manuscript is in the Bodleian Library. So it's there. Okay. And in 1079, it says that five Jews came over the sea bearing gifts for the High King. Okay. <laughs> it's thought that they were trying to set up a trade route uh, with uh, Damascus and all of mm -hmm. those things because we had linen here and you know just um, to set up a trade route it, it just says five Jews came over the sea bearing gifts to the high king and then it says they were sent back okay I imagine the gifts were kept but anyway. right, okay. so that's the very first mention after that uh, there's it was never, never a settlement as such until this, in the time of the Spanish and Portuguese expulsion from Spain. Right. And some Jews came to uh, Yall, and they, they settled in Yall in the 14, late 1400s, early 1500s. And the family name was Agnes, and some of them became mayors in uh, in in um, in Yule. At that time, uh, Jews had been expelled from Britain, also Ireland. That yeah. meant Ireland at too. Time, yeah. So when they came in, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, when uh, Britain opened up again, when England opened up again, uh, there was a, quite a large Spanish and Portuguese uh, community in London, and they left Cork and went to London because there was a better chance for marriage and thought that perhaps one of the lost tribes from Israel oh. came, to, came to Ireland because you, you see in uh, the west of Ireland particularly there are names like Cohen, mm. Cowan, Levi, those are all Jewish names okay. and it's thought that in early history some of those tribes, that one of those tribes may have landed here. And it was thought for many centuries that the Torah was hidden under the hill of Tara. Tara, Torah. Tara, Torah. Mm. Yep. These are all just kind of stories or fables? Well, or... I mean, they, they had many archaeological digs to mm. see if they could find the, the Ten Commandments, yeah. which, were, which, which were supposedly hidden there. But of course, the hill of Tara goes back much earlier than that. Right. By the side of the Olympia, there's a lane called Crane Lane, because the Liffey came right up, and the cranes were unloading the ships there. All right. So in Crane Lane, there was a synagogue upstairs. There were prayer rooms upstairs where, you know, can you imagine the journeys people must have had at the times? Um, people who originally came to Dublin uh, around about the 1780s and so on, they would have been Austro-Hungarian, um, Austro-Hungarian, Dutch, German, perhaps some French, uh, there were... So they were just kind of naturally coming to Ireland, like they immigrating? They were just coming to Ireland, not, not because... For any particular any... reason? No, I don't think so. Perhaps things may have been a little uncomfortable where they were okay. and they decided they'd rather come to uh, 
to somewhere else. In 1881, there were, I think, 490 Jews in the whole of Ireland. Okay. In 1891, there were almost 1,800. Wow. And that's because of the pogroms in Eastern Europe. Right. So when those Jews came from Eastern Europe, there was already what one would call a settled community. Mm -hmm. So the Jews that came to Ireland, uh, the settled community, they became, edu I mean, education was everything, as it is to any refugees, because that's in your head and yeah. you can take that where you, wherever you go. Yeah. So they became doctors, dentists, lawyers, uh, judges, right. uh, politicians. Mm. So they always... It was a small community, but it punched above its weight. And when yeah. you go downstairs, you can see yeah. um, the names of, of the people involved. So when the um, Eastern Europeans came from Lithuania, and my great-grandparents came from Lithuania, uh, from Germany, um, mainly Ger Germany and Lithuania, it's kind of the power of one. One family will come and mm. they'll find out, well, there's, there's no anti-Semitism, you know, it's okay. fine. And then the whole, the whole town will come. Right. That, that's the way it worked. Yeah. So you'll get people from Acme Anne, from Shavli, all, all of these different villages in, in uh, Lithuania or Poland or wherever. But there were uh, seven little synagogues around this area. There were also seven butchers down on, on, on Brussels Street. There isn't one in Ireland anymore. The kosher butcher. Yeah. All sorts of, all sorts of things. Well, I guess there's a lot to kind of unpick there. I mean, you kind of the important context really is the history of political anti-Semitism in Ireland. Whether that was strong where it was strong and where it might have manifested in the case of a, of a German invasion. Um, De Valera, for example, was the target himself of anti-Semitic conspiracies, even though he didn't have Jewish ancestry. There was a, a, um, a you know, these pamphlets that you'd see in sort of ultra-right conservative circles in Britain that suggests that he was of Spanish Jewish heritage and so on. And so that de Valera himself was part of an international Jewish conspiracy. Um, would they have, would the Irish people have welcomed a Nazi takeover? I don't think so. Would there have been collaborators? Yes. And there would have been collaborators in Britain too. And, you know, this is the, that is the sort of reality of it. And, and anti-Semitism, there's people doing work on it now, but I think that um, anti-Semitism in early 20th century Irish political life needs to be studied in more detail because it manifests itself in very, um, very subtle ways. And there's kind of all, all, it's always to find the more direct things like Arthur Griffith writing directly anti-Semitic things, but then there's something that a historian called Tricia Kessler looks at, which is like different immigration processes and how the immigration processes themselves are, are built around anti-Semitic ideas. So yeah, so I think the, the, the way of tackling that question is really talking about, you know, is using the question as a launch point to think about where anti-Semitism existed in Ireland and, and, and dismissing and uh, undermining that idea that Ireland was somehow a welcoming place for Jewish people, because in many ways it was not. Yeah, I mean, the evidence seems to show that it wasn't as opening as we would hope it would be. And um, there's a bit of um, contradiction in the, the amount of Jewish children that were allowed in compared to the amount of Jewish, or sorry, uh, German children, which is, uh, which is really interesting. Um, so I'm actually going to talk to you a bit more outside of Ireland, if that's okay, and about the Irish and Jewish interactions in different countries. So if we move to the UK and over to London, can you tell me a little bit about the uh, the Battle of Capel Street? Yeah, so, I mean, it's an interesting moment. Um, and, of course, it's this very um, symbolic moment within the wider history of anti-fascism, whereby um, East Londoners gathered together to resist Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists marching through a Jewish area. And many sources from the time, you know, say that there was 
Irish um, dockers also standing alongside their uh, their Jewish neighbours. Um, and uh, it also is part of a much wider history of, of East London and Irish and Jewish interaction in East London, which dates back into the 19th century. The Irish were... Um, the sort of working poor of East London, and then they came to live alongside the, the Jewish working poor, particularly in the wake of the pogroms in, in Eastern Europe in the 1880s and onwards. And that relationship was not, um, it was certainly not one of gradually building solidarity, which then exploded in, in, in the Battle of Cable Street. I think it was more a, um, or a Battle of Cable, is it Cable? I always get mixed up Cable or Cable. I think it's Cable. Street. I would say I would say Cable, but I thought that was very similar to the Irish Street. Street. Yeah, yeah, I think it's Cable Street, because Cable. Cable Street is the one in Dublin, that's why I yeah. get mixed up. Yeah, so this moment of solidarity, I think, was in a way somewhat exceptional in a wider history of contestation and, and of moments of, of getting along easily, um, but also of, of moments of, um, yeah, certainly moments of anti-Semitism and uh, yeah it's, it's a complex and interesting history and what I'd really love is for someone with um, Yiddish speaking abilities to read through the East London press mm. and find out how Irish people were discussed within that press I think would be very interesting insight into the intercommunal relations. There's a there is an author whose name escapes you right now who wrote a great book on um, Irish and Jewish diaspora interactions, particularly around socialist politics uh, in the east of London, um, that I, I really find kind of very insightful on a lot of this, these kind of questions. Yeah, so if these uh, two communities, the Irish and Jewish community, are living side by side and fighting fi side by side, is there evidence that, you know, they got on well, that they had many interactions, or was this just the anti-fascist, like, fight that they had on their hands, or, um, or what, would, what was the reason for that? Um, there is a lot of evidence and you kind of have to be open to, to finding it. But I mean, all of these are sort of everyday interactions and you need to kind of think of the kind of cityscape as very complex and open to these kind of encounters, right? So, I mean, when you go into a shop, you don't necessarily, necessarily know the ethnic identity of everyone in there, but you might know if it's Jewish tailors or this is a, you know, and so on. So there were those everyday relationships that were created by the simple fact of proximity and by necessity. Uh, you needed to clothe yourself, for example, and that kind of stuff. And what I've become increasingly interested in is, is looking at romantic relationships, um, not just between Jewish migrants and Irish migrants, but wider Eastern European migration and Irish migration in the early 20th century, because I think that those, every couple tells a different story about those kind of spaces, how open these spaces were for encounter, like I'm thinking of one Latvian Irish couple and this Latvian guy claims that um, he was on, running a fish and chip shop in the early 20th century and he um, bought a motorcycle and uh, went on a motorcycle trip to Tipperary and was just so taken with this Tipperary farm girl that um, he proposed to her and then they got married. And so there's that story there is about, you know, traditional migrant businesses in Ireland, which was fish and chip shops, um, and also about uh, crossing those different, what might seem like divides, right? There would have been a linguistic barrier, I'm sure, but then also this idea of different cultures coming together. Um, mm. it's, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, there's probably a movie to be made there <laughs> with that story. Um, so if we go back across the sea again, back to Ireland, um, it seems that there was some pretty openly anti-Semitic people involved in, in politics at the time in Ireland. Not many, but some. Um, can you talk to me about Father Dennis Fahey from Tipperary and what influence he might have had in politics at the time? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult not to trace his influence aside from he was certainly very influential in terms of the, the thoughts and arguments of uh, Charles um, we would say Charles Coughlin in Ireland, but I think the Americans pronounce it Charles Coughlin, who was an incendiary far-right radio priest. Dennis Fahey was a Holy Ghost father at 
Rockwell, um, which is in Tipperary. And he wrote a number of essentially like anti-Semitic screeds, propaganda pamphlets, which um, uh, troublingly are actually still in print um, by kind of far right outlets to share them around. It's a really sort of theologically grounded anti-Semitism. And um, it's, it's not, it certainly doesn't surprise anyone. There's few innovations in it. It's very much this idea of the Judeo-Bolshevik mythology, that there is something innate about Judaism that leads them towards these revolutionary ideologies and, and world control and so on. And that was his, that was his, his thesis, essentially. And it did have influence, um, an influence in the US. Charles Kaufman picked it up and it became part of, of his own um, his own defense of his apologetics for, for fascism uh, in the 1930s. So yeah, uh, Sean William Gannon is someone, uh, a scholar who's done a lot of great work on tracing the, trying to pick the both overt and kind of covert influence of these ideas um, of, you know, these anti-Semitic ideas and how they influenced the church in Ireland, which of course the church influenced Ireland. So yeah, it, it's always, you have to be careful about focusing on the very overt anti-Semites because then you miss the, the, the subtle ways in which these sort of politics of hatred seeped into to Ireland. And you can trace that from those kind of origins then into something like what Trisha Kessler works on, which is like looking at immigration policy. So where do these people develop these anti-Semitic ideas and what's mm. the, the atmosphere of anti-Semitism in Ireland and where are those ideas develop? Those are kind of questions that we need to think more about as historians because they're very relevant today when we think, yeah. where, where do racist ideas come from mm. and what are we consuming that might lead us to think these things? Yeah, agreed. And one of his big, yeah, this is Dennis Fahey, um, one of his big issues was with the De Valera's constitution, right? And that there was a specific protection guaranteed to Jewish people, which was very unusual. Um, I guess, was this one of the reasons as well? Maybe De Valera was seen as a, you know, Jewish or a lover of the Jews? The, the conspiracy theory that Dennis Fahey it's a bit muffly there now. Can you hear me okay now? I can perfectly, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was some, for some reason my laptop connected to these suddenly. Um, De Valera, the, the conspiracy around De Valera um, being part of an international Jewish conspiracy dates to really the War of Independence, and that's where I've seen it most active. Um, but that provision in the constitution is interesting. I remember we were always told during my undergrad that it was worth thinking about because, um, you know, I'm not going to stand over the 1937 constitution and say it was forward looking, but it's important in the context of Europe at that time, that there was a provision made that the, the Jewish community, you know, um, had a right to the title of, of Irish and, and was a part of the national community. So yeah, I do think that's, I don't, Perhaps Dennis Fahey um, found that particularly objectionable, but I imagine that, yeah, I mean, Fahey was keen on maintaining his kind of political networks as well, so he could look past certain things, I guess, too. Yeah, well, at one stage, Yiddish was the third most spoken language in Ireland. I uh, figured that out yesterday at my trip to the museum, uh, which I found really interesting. Oh. Um, mm. So it makes sense that, you know, if there's such a, high profile community in Ireland that they would be protected of course they should be you know but um, mm-hmm. if we move across the Atlantic and I was actually going to bring this guy up and you just mentioned him Charles Coughlin Father Charles H- Coughlin um, mm-hmm. can you talk a little bit about this guy I'd never heard of him before um, watching your video uh, he seems like a, a kind of a Howard Stern character very popular on the radio um, yeah I mean there's a lot of interesting kind of media theory around him like whether he is the sort of prototypical what is it shock jock or is that the right term not sure it's like i you know it's like someone who goes on the radio when they're you know they're, they're like a contra- controversy is how they build yeah. their profile right so like he um he's actually he was actually canadian um and he was irish but 
distantly so, if I'm remembering correctly. I did the genealogy on him, and I think it was like um, the Irish migrant was about three generations back. But he, he would, Irish diaspora Catholicism would have been his um, his social world of his of his childhood for sure. But he rises to prominence in the U.S. and he rises to prominence um, as a radio priest. Uh, initially, for example, supportive of Roosevelt's New Deal, but then takes a, a, a turn towards um, speaking and admiring fascism and then becomes uh, quite anti-Semitic as well, or not quite extremely anti-Semitic at the end of the 1930s. So he, um, he gets put off the air, but there's also lots of interesting um, interesting research done into how the protests which are very resonant today when we think of them when when he was put off the air when he's threatened to be put off the air there were all these kind of protests about free speech right and um you had uh street fights you had uh italians and and even some irish people getting picked up by the police for attacking those who were calling for fight to be kept off the air it's yeah it's kind of interesting to think about that in the modern context because this seems to be one of the early examples of a quote unquote free speech controversy and it's mm. one of the early examples of like here's a new platform radio today we might think social media mm. and it's figuring out who if the platform is democratic or if the platform is unmoderated what are the knock on consequences and yeah. where does moderation need to exist and so on um, so yeah, there's a lot of interesting kind of questions that that it that it brings up. That is really interesting. Yeah, I never made that connection, and that's uh, the great thing about history, isn't it? We can always learn from uh, things that happened in the past. Um, mm. So why was this this guy Coughlin so popular? Like, why did he appeal to the Irish Catholics? Let's say, is, was it just the fact that he was Catholic? You know, is that enough, or was was there some something there in the Irish that um, was appealing? Mm. I mean, it would be, I couldn't, you know, there's no, there's nothing, you could never say that there's anything essential about Irishness in the diaspora that, that would make Irish people racist, right? Or, it, you know, there's nothing that, I think that Fatty was popular across the board. Um, his popularity was very striking. He was, like so many of these kind of figures, charismatic in that sense that his voice could grab your attention. Why he was popular in Irish? Sure, it, it was. A, I'm sure it was about Catholicism. Um, I'm sure it was about how the politics of hatred thrives, which is um, dislocating a community's sense of, of who their enemy is, right? It's not the, it's the, it's your neighbour. You know, it, it, he teaches that it's your neighbour who's your enemy, not the not the people who are keeping you all down, right? So about making hatred and enmity horizontal rather than, in a way, vertical and and um, trying to overcome the authorities that, that's keeping everyone in subjugation. So in a way, he's interesting, again, kind of going back to my last answer, he's, he's interesting from when we think of him structurally and what he represents, these issues of free speech and, and why racist ideas thrive not just among Irish communities, but among like all communities. And what makes these ideas appealing is because they're sort of right. They're like, um, they, they're, they're easily digestible narratives and they also fuel passions, which are kind of compulsive and addictive, like hatred and fear. Um, and so it's about overcoming that, um, which is why I think he's, he's, he's worth thinking about. I agree. Yeah. So, very interesting. I know, like, just like London, there's examples of in New York uh, during like the Five Points era of like mm. Irish people living alongside Jewish people, living alongside Black people in like some uh, some sort of you know harmony, but also conflict at the same time, some sort of mm. mishmash mm. Uh, boiling pot. Um, so if we move across again the Atlantic back to Ireland to the modern mm -hmm. day, um, I listened recently to uh, Morris Cohen, um, who is um, the chairman of the Jewish Council of Ireland. And he said that there's very little anti-Semitism in Ireland. He said he experienced basically none his whole life. But he said what you see is a very passionate support of the Palestinian cause, 
And he says mm-hmm. that that is, he doesn't feel like that's necessarily anti-Jewish. He feels that that's the Irish um, naturally uh, supporting the underdog or the person being oppressed or oppressed, as he said. Um, what do you have any opinion on what do you consider like the levels of anti-Semitism to be in Ireland at the moment? Is there zero or is it there? Um, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not Jewish, so I've certainly never experienced something personally um of course it exists uh, that's the point i guess a lot of great um anti-semitism scholars such as the was based at the birkbeck institute for anti-semitism would make is that you have to understand the ways in which these tropes and stories like the conspiracy of jewish control find new ways to tell themselves and you know mm. feed them back into new contexts like during COVID, right? COVID skepticism. There was, in Ireland, definitely a thread of anti-Semitism running through that because it's using these, if you think of stories as like a narrative, it's like using these different threads of the story in different ways because it's proved so effective in the past, right? So like it's a world council who's putting in 5G to give us all COVID Mm. or something like that. And the word Jewish might, might not be used by conspiracy theorists, but it's almost done with a kind of wink and a nudge as though like when George Soros is mentioned and he's been mentioned by politicians in the Dole, and they might even not know they're feeding back into uh, anti-Semitic conspiratorial trope in doing so, and yet they are. So that's also something that we also need to think about racism. It's not just, uh, you know, you don't just wake up one morning and say, okay, I'm going to commit myself to racism and I'm going to just hate whatever community each day it's something that we need to be constantly aware of how our everyday interactions um might be constitute like might be caused by atmospheric ideas like anti-semitic conspiracies or or so on sorry i'm kind of losing the thread here so yes there is anti-semitism in ireland um and and there would be a fear that it will grow stronger particularly because of these platforms like Facebook, um, like, you know, we all know someone in our towns or in our immediate family who fell down the rabbit hole during COVID. And at the end of the day, all these anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories usually come back to those, those like core, core stories, right? Those like core threads about yeah, um, world Jewish control or something like that. Yeah. So we have to be on the lookout for it um, around, uh, yeah, so that's kind of would be my answer to that. Yeah, I wonder, like, um, I would witness more, you know, anti-Muslim uh, discrimination. Um, and that's probably because we see more Muslims in Ireland at the moment. Like, you don't see uh, the Orthodox Jews walking down the street, you know, very often. Um, the Jewish community is actually uh, rising in terms of population. Um, mm. However, the practicing uh, Jewish population is staying the same or decreasing. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of the younger Jewish people coming over and not actually practicing. Um, and I just wonder if they were, and if they were out there more, um, you, you saw, saw them out and about more often, would we see more anti-Semitism? If you know what I mean? Like, There's very little anti-Semitism because most people don't even recognize there, that there is Jewish people here in Ireland, you know? Yeah, in a sense, you got to be, you know, there's almost like, um, I believe, sort of, this, there's an element of this in Irish immigration policy that they didn't want to accept Jewish refugees because they felt that Ireland had no anti-Semitism and they didn't want it to grow. So it's sort of this argument that defeats its own purpose because, you know, right, it's like it, the community itself is not to blame for the hatred it receives. And so... I think that the increasing, if the increasing visibility of a community leads to an increased articulation of hatred, then that means that that reservoir of hatred was existing in the society already, yeah. and it's being tapped into. If if, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. That um, it's you know it's these people who are on these weird fringe Facebook groups who are suddenly have a kind of a a personified target for whatever they've been imbibing online. And that's why you, you would see the increase, not so much that visibility itself causes, causes hatred. I mean, I'll be, I'll be interested. It'll be interesting to see 
you know, we're in a real moment of, of change in Ireland in regards to this history because of the arrival um, of the Ukrainians um, to Ireland. I, and I'm sure there'll be many Jewish refugees amongst those Ukrainians because they have quite, quite a big community. And I don't think, I, I'm really interested in it as a historian. Um, I'm obviously really keen to help and that Ireland provide support to this community, but this will create its own significant chapter in Irish history 100 years from now. Because when the period that I'm looking at, you know, I'm more and more interested in Eastern European migration in Ireland in the early 20th century. The majority of those immigrants were Jewish. Um, and what's interesting there is that they were the second largest foreign born population in Ireland in the 1901 and 1911 census. So that's David Fitzpatrick's calculations, I think he's put it at about 26,000 people born in territories that then constituted the Russian Empire. The first, the, the largest foreign born population was Americans, but actually that's um, somewhat uh, distorted in a sense that a lot of those Americans were actually American born children of returned Irish immigrants. So whether or not those people would have classified themselves as Americans are simply mm -hmm. born in America. It's yeah. harder to pick out. But with that Eastern European community, you have people identifying as Russian, Lithuanian, Ukrainian, Jewish, and so on. Um, so if you think about the 26,000 people and how many books have been written about different threads or people from that community and how they shape that history, I mean, we're receiving something equivalent to that, if not much more, each week in Ireland from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So... Um, that impact is going to be huge. I, I'm, I'm, you know, of course, the reason why Ukrainians are here is a tragedy and, and is an exciting opportunity for Ireland to welcome this community and to make them a part of that structure and to learn from these histories that you and I are talking about, about how you make people feel welcome, but not just welcome, but you need to, I think, what's really important is that you need to make migrants feel like they have a stake in the future of the nation. You know, little things like voting rights and so on are really important for everyone to feel like they have a voice in how the future changes. And so that's what's um, really important. I'm, tr I'm doing work uh, now. I live in Belfast now, but I'm beginning to work with the Ukrainian community here and I'm very keen to sort of... Um, to uh, to help out and to try and be someone who who isn't just sort of researching this history, but trying to kind of of shape how its 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 modern echo is playing out right now.